Good morning. Good morning, Sioux City First. So uh, last week we started with talking about the Holy Spirit and we really covered uh, a big part of that. Ne this next week, this week we're going to cover more about the Holy Spirit, but I want to encourage you uh, uh, to make sure you're here uh, next week. Next week we're going to change it up and we're going to actually have Shelly Rawson or Rochelle Rawson come. It's going to be kind of an interview style and she's going to be sharing her testimony and also what God is doing through Agape Community Services or what God is beginning to do in Agape Community Services dealing with uh, drug addiction and the gospel here in Sioux City. And so she's got a real powerful testimony and I've invited her to come and we're going to kind of do an interview style. I think you guys will all be really encouraged by her uh, her testimony and her journey to Christ, um, and also just really encouraged. She's like the most encouraging, bubbly person. Like she's up there on the list, like big time. Team Jesus, if you if you ever watch this, Shelly, Team Jesus is coming coming next week, and uh, um, I, I encourage you to show up. I think it's going to be fun and it's going to be a powerful testimony time. But this week we're going to again focus in on the Holy Spirit, and we're going to uh, be talking about spirit baptism. But first, we have to talk about Pizza Hut. We got to talk about Pizza Hut back in the 90s. And for those, some of you were around Sioux City in the 90s, and you remember that the Hy-Vee gas station at the Southern Hills Mall used to be a Pizza Hut. That's what it used to be in the 90s when, when I was working. So, and I need to tell you a story about my disastrous experience working at Pizza Hut. So uh, back when I was in uh, my teens, 16 years old, I started working at Carmike Theaters, which is now AMC Theaters. The mall movie theater is what it, it was what it was. And uh, that job came with a lot of perks, uh, free movies, etc. cetera. But the other, there was one big downside. You got paid minimum wage. And the only way you were getting a raise is if the state legislature raised the minimum wage. That's how you got a raise at the Carmike Theaters. And uh, I, I, I enjoyed working there, but I realized I would like to make a little more money. And there's this Pizza Hut right by the mall, and uh, they have servers, and those servers get tips. And so I had a, a connection there, and I went ahead and applied for a job there and received the job. And uh, I started as a server at Pizza Hut. It didn't last very long, but we're going to talk about that for a moment. What I, what I realized is that I was kind of rushed through a training process that maybe I didn't understand, and my 16-year-old brain just didn't really comprehend everything correctly, and honestly, there was a lot of mistakes along the way. I mean, how hard is it to serve pizza in a pizza place? Well, I think I made plenty of mistakes, but, for the, but in that two or three weeks I worked there, there came a moment that I realized this is really not for me. And that was this. Is there, there was one night I was the only server there. It was later in the evening, and two families had come in. And uh, from the waiting station, which is, imagine it being right here, one sat on the right side and one was got sat on the left. They both came in eh, roughly the same time. And to my dismay, they both ordered roughly the same pizza and, and, uh, and or they essentially had the same order, roughly the same order. So uh, I take their orders and I take it back and I put it in and they go ahead and make the pizzas and the breadsticks and et cetera, et cetera. Well, the pizza comes up and it's my job to deliver the pizza to the table. And I grab it and I come to the front of the wait station and I look and realize I don't know who this pizza goes to. But my 16-year-old brain thought a couple of things. Number one, either way, I've got a 50-50 shot of being right, right? I mean, I've got one and two. And the second piece is I think the people on the right came in first, and it would be logical that the first pizza up would be the first pizza ordered, right? So I took a shot and just went ahead and delivered that pizza to the folks sitting on the right. They were happy. And I turned back around, and I went to the wait station, and maybe 60 seconds goes by when someone walks up to the wait station and is like, could you come here for a moment? And the sink in the stomach begins. As I walk over and I look, the pizza's on the table, and a slice, one of the kids taking one of the slices and put it on their plate, and they're like, this is not the pizza we ordered. And I knew, and you know, 
I have a shocked face. What? How could this be? In the moment, though, I know. I gambled. I flipped the coin, and I got the wrong table. Well, I, good news is, is they hadn't taken a bite. They hadn't taken anything from it. They just simply took one slice out and hadn't been touched. And I said, well, go ahead and put that slice back in. <laughs> and my 16-year-old brain said, listen, now I know what the right table is. So I lift that pizza up, and I walk it across the room to the other table, and I put it down. And I said, this, here's your pizza. Their faces sealed my end of the career at Pizza Hut. As they looked up at me and looked at the other table, and I remember the dad looking at me and going, was that over there? And here's my 60 year old logic, undefeatable. Yes, it was, but they didn't eat it at all. So it's good. Needless to say, it wasn't good, and neither was I. I was clearly not cut out for this job. I was not well-trained. I was not well-versed. And uh, I went ahead and submitted my resignation, and I went ahead and went back to the theaters, because I knew the theaters, and I knew how to work that system. Uh, this morning, we're going to see that we've got individuals who are in the sa- in a, actually in a better situation than I was at Pizza Hut, but yet Jesus said they weren't quite ready And we're going to talk about that. So we're going to go into Acts chapter 1, and we're going to talk about the day of Pentecost. But Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 4, gathering them together, he, Jesus, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, to, to wait for the Father, for wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they began asking him, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the remotest parts of the earth. You know, it's... um, Most people look at the day of Pentecost and this moment of pause that Jesus gives the disciples and says, well, they just weren't ready. But I'd like to point out that these apostles and disciples had spent nearly three years with Jesus. They heard almost every teaching, both public and private. They heard more than we have ever heard out of Jesus' mouth. They saw and experienced Miracle after miracle, people being raised from the dead, people getting up and walking, being healed of leprosy. They saw signs and wonders, Jesus being able to literally move the weather, stop and calm seas, walk on water, and much more. In fact, it's often forgotten that in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sends these disciples out to go out two by two with nothing but their clothes, to go out and begin ministering the gospel, and he empowers them to do miracles, and they come back and report that they'd cast out demons, that people experienced miracles, so on and so forth. But in this moment, three years in Jesus' boot camp, and Jesus says, that's not enough. I'm about to leave, and you're not ready. You will be ready when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, which makes last week's session so much more important that Jesus says you are not ready until the Holy Spirit shows up to the scene. And so we'll, we'll dive into that here, going into Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And then when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues that looked like fire appeared on them, distributing themselves, and a tongue rested on each one. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. 
Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished. Why are not these all these men Galileans? How is it that we hear them speak in our language to which we were born? We're going to skip all the way down to into verse 11 because he basically goes through the litany of, 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 of races and tribes that were there. And picking up in verse 11, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking our own tongues about the mighty deeds of God. And, when, and they all continue in amazement and great perplexity, saying to another, what does this mean? And others were jeering and saying, these men must be full of sweet wine. They're drunk, they're high, whatever you want to call it. They are out of their minds. So what we see is, is that the Holy Spirit has now entered the picture. Jesus has gone to the Father and asked him to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit just arrived on the scene. And they have experienced something they've never experienced before. And Peter, for all of his mistakes in the gospel, all of a sudden, in the rest of chapter 2, he lays out and speaks up. He is empowered by the Holy Spirit with boldness, understanding, wisdom, and knowledge that he didn't have just a few moments prior. And he essentially gives a sermon and lays out the gospel and the challenge to all these Jews who are gathered around him. And then we skip to the response all the way down in verse 37. The reaction is this. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what, was, what must we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and all those who are far off. We see that you know, we talked about the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. What happened is Peter received and the apostles received something they never received before, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or spirit baptism with evidence of speaking in tongues that gave him a boldness that as he spoke, he spoke God's words in God's timing and the Holy Spirit's convicting work pierces the individuals to the heart. The rest of the those first verses talk about 3,000 are now turned to to, they're turned to God and they've repented and they become part of the church. Essentially, this is the shotgun start of the church that we are experiencing today. In this moment, this is what's happening. The Holy Spirit shows up and something amazing happens. Now, listen, we know that A, the apostles were already saved. They were already believers in Jesus. When they gathered around and they were essentially in the upper room, they already believed on Jesus. So that really didn't change anything. They had already worked miracles and, 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 and professed their faith to other people and been involved in supernatural activity. That didn't change. But what did change was the Holy Spirit becoming unleashed and they experienced spirit baptism so that, they, so that Peter could receive Knowledge, power, and ability that he didn't have before, a boldness that he didn't have before. For me, taking just one step back from that, for me, my spirit baptism story uh, goes all the way back to grade school. I don't know exactly how old I was when I was spirit baptized. I just know that we were attending, uh, it used to be Central Assembly of God, but now it's Cross Point. Dan Bittinger is the pastor over there. But it used to be uh, Central Assembly of God, and that's where we attended in my early grade school years, my early memories. But I just remember in kids' church, kids' church, Sunday school, something along that lines, we were essentially having that. And uh, the, the Sunday school teacher said, essentially said, hey, we're going to have some young people, some teenagers who had recently gone to a convention or a camp, and they were going to pray for spirit baptism, that we'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And essentially laid out, didn't go into some deep theological explanation of what spirit baptism was, but just said, if you love Jesus and you want more from him, this is something you need to experience. And so uh, the kids, 
they said, if you want to go ahead and get spirit baptized, you just get up in this line, and we're going to lay hands on you and pray for spirit baptism. Listen, I was the last one in that line, last one in that line. But I knew this. I love Jesus, and if he's got something for me, I want it. And I couldn't just explain it all. There was just this prompting that I wanted more. But I, I still got in the back of the line. But uh, they prayed for multiple people. And most people, honestly, didn't experience spirit baptism that morning. But when they got to me, they surrounded me, and we just started to pray. And I started to pray. I just lifted my hands and started to pray to God in the language I knew. And then all of a sudden, I felt this overwhelming sense that the Holy Spirit was there, just uh, almost like being flooded with him. And the next thing I knew, I was speaking a language I didn't understand, and I was feeling something I'd never felt before. It was like being dunked in the Holy Spirit. And that's really what the, when you look at the Greek, in that the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's kind of that same model, that Holy Spirit baptism essentially is a dunking in the Holy Spirit. It's a separate and distinct event from your salvation, from him coming inside of you, and also working to sanctify you and draw you closer to Jesus. It's a separate and distinct event that's meant to empower you, give you a new prayer language, and give you spiritual gifts that you can use in sharing your testimony with other non-believers, as well as sharing and stirring up the body of Christ. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about spirit baptism. We're, a, you know, we're, we're, we're assemblies of God, we're Pentecostal. And there's lots of people who talk about spirit baptism in very different ways. And there's some mis common misconceptions about spirit baptism. Number one is, is that spirit baptism isn't for everybody. That just some people experience spirit baptism in the speaking in tongues. But the Bible makes it clear that actually it's for every believer. That every believer who will trust in Jesus can receive it, and it's an empowerment to do his work in the world. And so the scripture says, even here in the scripture we just read, that it's for you, it's for your children, and it's for, it's for everyone who's afar off. Essentially, this concept that he wants to draw each and every one of us to a place where we experience spirit baptism. Number, the second misconception, it's all about the tongues. And, and essentially, that's part of it is, is that, well, it's tongues, it's tongues, it's tongues. No, it's about spirit baptism. It's hard to sometimes separate the two, but the reality is, is that spirit baptism is a separate, distinct event that you experience with the Holy Spirit one-on-one. -on -one. The evidence you received it is tongues. That's the evidence. You know, just like uh, being married, how do I know I'm married? Well, well, Chris and I walked down an aisle and we we shared vows with each other, and we, we, you know, we had that moment of kiss, and we signed a marriage certificate saying that we're legally married and we're spiritually married. I know we're married because of that. How do you know you've received spirit baptism? The Bible lays out very clearly that the pattern of spirit baptism is that it's evidenced by speaking in tongues. And so much so that we, as we stand here today, we're, you know, the people who received spirit baptism at the first were all Jews, but later on, Jesus, uh, Jesus evidences to the, to the apostles that salvation has come to those who are non-Jews through the baptism of, uh, of the Holy Spirit by evidence of speaking in tongues. It convinced them that God is at work in each and every one of us because they didn't understand what spirit baptism was, but all of a sudden they received salvation and they spoke in tongues as evidence that the Holy Spirit was at work inside of them. So it isn't so much speaking about tongues as it is about having that separate spiritual event with the Holy Spirit. The, another misconception is God just takes over. He just makes that lip start flapping, and the tongue starts a-moving, and all of a sudden he takes over. That misconception, oftentimes as Pentecostals, there's a narrative that, right, we're, we're you know, hey, we're, you know, we're rolling down the aisles, we're shaking and quaking. But here's the reality is, is that spirit baptism isn't any different from salvation in this sense. I sense God doing something on me. I feel him drawing me. I take a step forward. Maybe you step to an altar. Maybe you just bow to need where you were in your bedroom or in your living room. Maybe you prayed with a friend. 
you know, whatever the case may be, wherever you were, there was a moment you felt drawn and there was a moment that you asked God into your heart. And the moment you prayed that prayer, the, the common tales are all the same. Joy, forgiveness, a relief, a weight off my shoulders, a sense of God's presence in a brand new way, a sense of complete completeness and wholeness takes over that you hadn't experienced 30 seconds before. What happened? You felt prompted by God. You took a step of faith. And when you did, he was there to pick you up. Just like a kid jumping off the edge of a pool, waiting for daddy to catch him in his arms. That's essentially what's happening here. There's no catch without a jump. And that's the same with spirit baptism. God's not controlling your tongue. He's not taking you over. It, it, it's not like that at all. What it is is that you come forward prompted by the Holy Spirit. You trust him and believe him. You ask to receive it. You lift him up in praise. And then when you feel the Holy Spirit come upon you, you take those first steps and you try to speak in a tongue that you don't understand. And when you do, God does the rest. And he gives you the words to speak and you feel the overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. The other thing is, is that, whole, you know, I'm just not holy enough. You know, you think to yourself, well, you know, yeah, spirit baptism, that's maybe for the pastor staff or people who've been really good and are really excellent Christians and know their theology. But my testimony, you think some grade school kid understood what spirit baptism was? I, I just knew I loved Jesus and that, that he had something more for me. The Gentiles later in Acts, they didn't know that spirit baptism even existed. They received salvation, felt an overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit, and began speaking in tongues as evidence of what the Holy Spirit was doing in their hearts and their minds. It's not for the highly educated. It's not that you have to have your theology degree. It's not that you even have to be perfect. Listen, if you've crossed the line of salvation, no matter where you're at today, spirit baptism is for you. He wants you to experience it. In fact, I would say this. It's not your idea. It's his. He is not, you are not trying to convince God. He's trying to convince you that his Holy Spirit wants to meet you in this special and unique way. It opens up doors of opportunity and boldness and opens up other spiritual gifts along the way. So we see that we don't have to be holy enough. God's not going to take, take, completely take you over. Uh, you know, that we're not going to go through this process where we're, you know, we're overwhelmed, but rather we just humbly come and we ask to receive something we've never received before. But there's going to be some people in this room as we're, we're kind of circling in, we're not landing, we actually have some things to do before we get to closing, but, you know, spirit baptism, some of us in this room, you've experienced spirit baptism. You, you, you've, you've, you've experienced spirit baptism. It's not something that's brand new to you but it's been a long time. I'm here to tell you this morning, we're gonna be praying in a little bit. If you haven't experienced spirit baptism, we're, we wanna open the doors to you. And trust me, our church is rooting for you. We're here, we know it's a vulnerable moment. It's a little, little bit nerve wracking, but we, we know that God's got something really good for you if you'll trust him. But if you haven't, but if you haven't experienced spirit baptism, today, it's like a buffet. It's all you can eat. The Holy Spirit is here and he wants to refill you all over again and have a fresh experience with the Holy Spirit uh, through spirit baptism. So it's, it's for everyone. It's not just for those who never experienced, but rather those who become stale. God wants to douse you in the Holy Spirit. He wants to flood your, flood your soul with his Holy Spirit in a brand new way so that you can uh, know him more and be closer to him, but also be more empowered for ministry and for also for um, uh, uh, all for ministry, both to the non-believer and the other, and 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 for believers themselves. So here's what it looks like. We're gonna we're gonna go through it in just a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have some altar time. I'm gonna walk you through what that's gonna look like. But this is what it is. If you if it's been a long time since you've experienced spirit baptism, or you've never experienced it before, we're gonna keep it real simple. We'll give you some words of instructions as we go to prayer is that number one, simply, we know it's a vulnerable moment, but we're rooting for you. We want, the, we want the Holy Spirit to have you this experience with you. It's simple. When you go, we're going to have you pray with uh, some of the pastoral staff. Simple as this. 
Come and ask. Just simply ask, Holy Spirit, baptize me. Make, give, the, give me that fresh experience. Just ask once and then just begin to lift him up in praise. Just begin to sh- share all the things that you're grateful for, all the things that you're thankful for. Just lift him up in praise. And then something's going to happen. You're going to feel the Holy Spirit's prompting. And in that moment is the moment of trust where you're standing on the edge of the pool and you got to make a leap. And that is, you got to simply, very, very simply, it comes down to this. You got the prompting of the Holy Spirit will, will prompt you to speak in a way you've never spoke before. And all you got to do is trust him. Trust him and move forward with it. And then the baptism comes upon you. And it's, it's, it truly is an amazing experience. Uh, and it's a powerful experience. You know, I, I'm an unabashed Pentecostal. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I trust him. Everything he does doesn't make sense. But boy, every time I jump, he's catching me. And he's doing something new. He gives me language to pray when I don't have words. And I think that if you haven't had that in a long time or you've never had it before, Jesus has got a big gift for you this morning. And he wants you to experience it. And he's trying to convince you to take a shot and trust him. For it. So with that, we'll go ahead and ask everybody to stand. We've got some instructions here. The pastoral staff is going to move off to the side. Uh, we've got uh, we've got some of the pastoral staff, um, and everybody's going to move off to the side. We want to pray. If you've never experienced spirit baptism or you need to refill in this morning, here's what we want you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come on out. And, and to, to get together with Tyler or Josh or Diane or myself or my wife. And let's, we, we want to pray with you to experience either refreshing or experience a refreshing of spirit baptism or baptism for the first time. Um, there's, now that leaves the rest of you who are standing here and what do you want to do? Well, very simply is, is let's say you see a family member or a friend who's never experienced it. And they've taken a vulnerable moment to move out. If you feel led by the Holy Spirit, you can go and pray together lay a hand on their back or a shoulder and pray for them to receive spirit baptism. We're going to be the church this morning and we're going to pray. And so, and if you don't feel prompted to do that, we've got one more assignment for you. If you want to stay right where you're at, that's fantastic. We ask this, find somebody to pray with. It's been a few weeks since we've prayed together as a congregation. Get to, get with your spouse Get with your family or your friends that you know have a need. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's a mental health need. Maybe it's a job need. Get together and pray. Don't be spectators this morning. Be participants in the word of God and be participants with the Holy Spirit, praying together, lifting each other up, whether it's up front or it's right where you're sitting. And then what is going to happen is after a few minutes, Josh is going to come up and close the service. we got a plan for this, but this is the moment of vulnerability. If you feel prompted this morning and you need a refilling or you need it for the first time, we're going to ask you to come on forward right now and just find a spot. doesn't matter if you're young or old, if it's been a long time or it's never happened. We want you to trust Jesus this morning and move on forward to uh, find somebody to pray with. And for those of you who aren't moving this morning, this is the time where you're going to go ahead and find somebody to pray with right now as we kind of get the music started on this time. We're going to go ahead and get the music started, and we're going to go ahead and open this time up for prayer. So find somebody to pray with. If you're not praying up here, we ask that you pray here right, uh, right where you're at.